Good morning. It's good to see you, and I'm thankful to be here. I mentioned we had a good weekend at camp and uh, had a good number of youth out there. Um, I don't know if you've ever met or heard of, um, oh, what's his name now, Joe. Uh, Joe Miller. He's moved into Bait, Batyville, I don't know, maybe two years ago or so. But uh, he was he was the speaker at camp this, this past week. He did a really good job. He encouraged the kids to memorize verses. And so handed out prizes to those who, who did it. And uh, got a good number of kids that did, did some verses. So it was a good weekend. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for each one that's here. And Father, we just thank you for the the weather that you've blessed us with, and for the opportunity to be in your house, to fellowship, and to uh, to look into your word. We just let this time before you, and we just ask your blessings on this. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, we're going to continue on in uh, James, James chapter 3, and... Uh, well, I got uh, just a few more chapters, but it's, it's going to take a little while to, to get through all this, but uh, it's been an interesting journey. James chapter 3, and we're going to uh, start with verse 1 there. James chapter 3 starts out saying, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater uh, condemnation, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the, the ships, which though they be so great, are driven in a fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasts great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire, fire of hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poisons. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be, that the fountains send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either vig uh, vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Let's go ahead and open up this portion of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, again as we come before you, uh, we thank you for this opportunity to look into the, the third chapter of James, and Father, as we go through it, I just pray that you speak to our hearts, help us to uh, see your truth and be able to apply uh, your wisdom in our lives. We just ask your blessings on this, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I talked a little bit about horses in there, in the verses, and so I'm going to start out with a little bit about horses. Just, uh, it's almost like dad jokes and puns here. What do you call a horse that lives next door? A neighbor. <laughs> uh, when going out of town, what part of the hotels do horses stay in? It's the bridal suite. Uh, the horse is so spontaneous that it always does things in the spur of the moment. <laughs> I got these online, so. <laughs> Why couldn't the pony speak? The 
because it was a little horse. Here's a photo I'm going to share with you too. Remember that old commercial? Maybe she's Maybelline. Maybe she, maybe she's barn with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. <laughs> Do you think you could get that square off? Ah. Uh. The passage starts out saying masters, which is an instructor. It means to teach. To teach. My brethren, be not many masters or many teachers. Uh, the New King James says, let not many of you become teachers. If you should have this in your booklet here. A couple other translations says, uh, the Bible in basic English says, do not all be teachers. Uh, the Luther German Bible, uh, when I went online to translate into English, it says, do not everyone overcome to be teachers. This word is translated master in the Gospels and refers to a person who functions in an official teaching or preaching capacity. Teachers are held at a higher standard than those that they uh, teach with. And it's not just uh, in the spiritual sense, but even as those of you that have been teachers in the school system, um, you're responsible for what you share with, with your, your students and you, you're held at a higher standard. As the age old saying goes, practice what you preach. Those who teach, preach, or instruct others in any way need to be able to live by the same standards that they promote. This even goes deep into things such as uh, law enforcement, for example. According to the Code of Conduct for Law Enforcement Officials, Article 7 states that law enforcement officials shall not commit any act of corruption. They shall also rig rigorously oppose and combat all such acts. Basically, this is to say that no one is above the law, not even those who enforce it, protect it, judge according to the law and many in society wish uh, to hold others in a higher form of punishment because of these standards whenever they these people knowingly break the law because they knew what they did was wrong and yet they went ahead and did it even though they're trying to impose the law on others we see in the next chapter james that it says in a uh, Verse chapter 4 verse 17 it says therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin so as a teacher we are to uh, to not only know good according to the scriptures but to do it it is not wrong or bad to be a teacher or to be a preacher or to be an instructor of any kind but James here cautions others not to rush to that position uh, such as uh, in such leadership that they might because they may be held in higher standards of correction and punishment than those that they instruct. Again, it says, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. A condemnation, it means a decision, um, basically judgment. Uh, the New King James again says, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment or we receive a stricter condemnation. Knowing that we shall receive a greater judgment, the word translated judgment usually expresses a negative verdict in the New Testament, and here it refers to a future judgment uh, for the unbelieving false teacher at the second coming, and you can cross-reference it with uh, Jude chapter, or verses 14 and 15. And secondly, for the believer, when he is rewarded before Christ, uh, this is not meant to discourage the true teachers, but to warn the prospective teachers of the role's seriousness. As previously seen in the Bible, Basic English, it says, Do not all be teachers, my brothers, because we teachers will be judged more hardly than others. Teaching is a great undertaking. It's a great job, a great task. It's a, it has a huge responsibility. Teachers will be held accountable at a higher level than students because, uh, again, of the teacher is instructing, they're informing, they're educating, they're guiding and on what to do and how to do it. 
This is true in a general sense, such as uh, school teachers, grades K through 12, college, universities, etc. But is even more so in the sense of a spiritual teacher, such as those uh, under them, they were responsible in leading others in the ways that honor and glorify God. And teaching is not only by the verbal instruction, such as in the classroom settings or from the pulpit or so forth, but just as much as the, uh, the verbal instructions, it's also the actions, the way that one lives their life, the things that they say and do uh, in their personal life, um, inside and outside the classroom, the pulpit, and so forth. People watch what you do, and as a teacher, your life will tell the world what you really believe. Do you believe and lead others towards God or away from Him? Um, by the way you live your life. Verses 2 and 3 there, it says, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. In verses 2 through 6, the discussion of the tongue is, is um, shared here. It's just a small part of the body, and yet it's powerful and even um, moves us and it will move us in the right direction or the wrong direction. And verse 2, if we are able to keep from offending or stumbling in our speech, then we're perfect. But um, it says uh, well, we would be able to control the whole body in living perfectly as well. But as humans, we're not able to do, uh, you know, the human nature takes over. And uh, we're we are, yet we're still required to strive for godly lifestyle. Verses three through five, James provided several analogies that show how the tongue, even though small, has the power to control one's whole person and influence and everything in his life. Verse three again says, "Behold, we put bits in our horses' mouths that they may obey us." And we turn about the whole body. Now listen to this article about the horse's bit found on the website called the Farm, Farmhouse. I have it in your in your notebook there too. Uh, there we go. It says a horse bridle is an important piece of equipment since the rider uses it to communicate. Notice that it, communicate communicate with the horse while riding. The three primary horse bridle parts are the headpiece, the bit, and the reins. The headpiece is the part that fits around the horse's head. Now the article goes on to say a bridle also includes reins and a bit. The reins consist of a long, narrow strap and attaches to the bit. Reins are held in the rider's hand and are used to guide a horse while riding. And using this as an analogy, think of God as, as uh, one holding the reins in our life, guiding us and moving us. A bridle bit goes into the, the horse's mouth and is used with the reins to communicate with the horse. The bit, the headpiece, and the reins all work together to form a means of communicating with the horse. Bits work by applying pressure inside the horse's mouth. Depending on the bit used, it may apply pressure on the horse's tongue, the roof, or the mouth. As it goes on to say in the last paragraph there, the way a bridle works takes advantage of a horse's natural inclina inclination to move away from the discomfort of, of pressure. It resort, results in the horses moving in the direction that the rider wants to go as the rider pulls on the reins as they pull left and right, pull back at the stop and so forth. By using strategic pulls, the, the rider signals what they desire of the horse. Keep in mind that the bits should only provide pressure and not pain for the horse. Notice the bit is used for communication, for guidance, for direction, and so forth. It's not meant to inflict pain, um, but it provides pressure as a part of the communication process. When we are living a life that has pressure in our lifestyle, the Lord could be using that to guide us, to motivate us, to move us in a specific direction that he intends us to go. Uh, take Jonah, for example. Uh, he didn't want to go to Nineveh. 
Uh, but God wanted him there. So Jonah faced various forms of pressure, which God used to move him and to direct him into the proper location. There uh, was the storm at sea, which then caused him to be cast into the waters. Uh, a large fish that swallowed him. Uh, the stomach acids in the creature changed Jonah's appearance. Uh, God used all of these things, these pressures, to direct Jonah to use him to go to Nineveh and to warn the people. So we may have various pressures in life, and God will use those just like the, the pressure in the horse's mouth to guide and direct. Uh, verse 4 through 6 goes on to say, Behold, also the ships which, though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasts of great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. The tongue is such a little organ in our, in our body that's so small and yet it's so large in stature. It can create the vilest of wars through the words that are spoken. And we see a lot of that going on even now with, with China and Russia and Ukraine and everything going on. And how, how these words are spoken. Are they spoken out of anger, hate, vengeance, rage, etc.? Like fire, the tongue's sinful words can spread destruction rapidly. Or as it's accompanying smoke, the words can permeate and ruin everything around it. The word hell in this um, passage here, the original word uh, comes from a Hebrew origin of uh, meaning, uh, well, we'll go over that in just a minute. But... Uh, it's basically a, uh, it's, it's a valley of Jerusalem used figuratively as a name for the place of everlasting punishment, which, of course, we know as hell. Um, it comes from two di different uh, Hebrew words. Uh, the first one, a gorge, uh, from its lofty sides. Uh, it's narrow, but uh, not a gully, like a valley. And it also comes from another word, probably of foreign origin, Apparently, a, Jeb, uh, a Jebusite, Hinnon. Um, a translation of the Greek word Gehenna, or the Valley of Hinnon, in Christ's time, this valley lay southwest of Jerusalem's walls. It served as a, as a city dump, and it was known for its constantly burning fires. Uh, Jesus used that place at to symbolize the eternal place of punishment and torment. To James, hell conjures up not just a place, but the satanic host that will someday inherit it. Uh, these, they use the tongue as a tool for evil, and that came from uh, MacArthur's footnotes there. Verses 7 and 8 reminds us, it's, again it says, For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea, is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poisons. Today we see all kinds of animals, uh, pets. They're used uh, for entertainment, for comfort, and so forth. More than just the average house dog, cat, or in some cases even snakes and birds. Uh, there's exotic animals such as lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my! <laughs> Uh, these animals are tamed and they're used uh, in, in zoos and circuses and other adventures and they're tamed by mankind uh, and yet while the most exotic of creatures are restrained and con controlled by the human race we still find it difficulty, uh, difficult and impossible to tame our own tongues we can tame these huge animals and creatures and yet taming our own small little tongue is, is very difficult um, out of the mouth comes disgusting speech. Uh, again, the Bible basic in English says it's an unresting evil. It's full of poison, 
of the poison of death. Matthew 15, verses 17 through 20 talks about the, the mouth, and it says, Do not ye understand that whatsoever endureth and at the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out into the drought. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulterers, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies, these are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. And Psalm 140 verses 1 through 3 it says, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man, preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart, continually are they gathered together for war. Verse 3 here, They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent's like a serpent, alder's poison is under their lips. So what do we feed our heart with? Uh, they even talked about this uh, at, at camp this past weekend, about what goes into the heart when, when it comes pouring back out through our, our actions and our speech is what we feed it. And, and what do we feed our heart with? Do we entertain our minds with godly and biblical truths or with worldly ideas? What goes in will indeed come back out. Uh, the saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. It comes out in our actions and our speech and with the same lips that have been used to curse or cuss or blaspheme, spew sinful hatred and anger are also used to sing praises to God, to bless his name. Verse 9 goes on to tell us, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. In other words, man is made in the form of God. And, you know, God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, as we see on through Genesis, how God created man after uh, his own image. Man is made in the similitude of God. Verse 10, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. So James is encouraging us to be careful what we say how we say it, and, and what we again let into our thoughts. Verses 9 through 10, from the same mouth comes both cursing towards fellow mankind who are made in the likeness of God. And then we turn around and the bless, and bless God or, or give praises to God. And James states a phrase very similar to the Apostle Paul when he asked if we should sin that grace might abound. Romans 6, 1 and 2 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, he says. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? James says, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. Verses uh, 11 and 12. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter water? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh water. Water cannot produce sweet and bitter water at the same time. It's, it's either one or the other. It's not both. Uh, vegetation grows uh, fruit and vegetables after its own kind. Fig trees can only grow figs, not olives, and olive vines can only grow olive, olives and not figs. A water fountain can only bring forth um, salty water, or fresh water, but not both at the same time. Our speech should be of only one kind, blessings and praises, not the cursings mixed with blessings. You know, out of the same hole in the face, so to speak, by which one sings praises, worships God, comes the cursing, swearing, gossip, backbiting, foul, disgusting words of speech. Uh, take your favorite Dessert, for example, uh, pie, ice cream, cake, whatever it might be. Now imagine how much you may be looking forward to it after, after a, a, a delicious meal that you just finished. Uh, the individual has spent great lengths preparing the meal and the dessert. The finest of everything is on the table. Even the, the china and everything, it, it, it's, it's just, it makes everything look delicious. 
And then when the dessert is placed in front of you, you see in that dish, in that bowl, on that plate, whatever it is, that that plate hasn't been washed probably for three months. Not only is there food on there from the past three times it was used, but now it's got other things growing on it, bacteria, mold, fungus. It really makes you feel good to, to see it, doesn't it? Uh, you, really gives you an appetite to want to dig into the dessert obviously not if anything you're repulsed you're disgusted and maybe even made sick now imagine how god feels when he hears these cursings coming out of one's mouth and at the same time the same mouth is used to uh, praise him james said it is uh james said it so well in verse 10 when he wrote out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing my brother, these things ought not to be. Remember the childhood song, Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. For the Father of above is looking down in love, so be careful, little mouth, what you say. We are challenged and we are encouraged by, John, by James here to think before we speak and to say things which glorify God. And it, not so much even in uh, the language such as cussing or cursing, but how do we say it? Are we saying it for self-gratification or for godly honor? Uh, it's not just so much the, the foul language or the four-letter words, but the intent of what we're saying. Our speech can take us on a wild journey. You know, people have been fired for saying the wrong thing to the wrong people at the wrong time. Some have lost friends because of hurtful words that were spoken, maybe even out of anger. But then on the flip side, the opposite has also occurred where the right speech has brought promotions, new friends, and a better life. I'll be careful of a mouth what we say. James encourages us to strengthen our faith by speaking words that are God-honoring and pleasing. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you, and as, as we uh, dove a little bit into the first 12 verses of chapter 3, we see the importance of our speech in, in what guides our speech? Uh, what do we think? What do we allow into our hearts and our minds? May they be your word, your truth, because as what comes in, so comes out in our actions and our speech. And Father, it's not so much even as the, uh, the specific words we say, but how we say it or why we say it. Father, James is encouraging us to consider our thoughts, to consider our speech that it, whatever is done, that it may be done to bring you glory and honor, even in the simplest little actions to the greatest of deeds. Father, we just lift this passage before you. Father, we just pray that uh, you continue to speak to our hearts and that uh, we are encouraged to live a life that brings you glory and honor in all that we think and say and do. Father, I lift our heavenly family before you. I pray for each and every one, even those that may not be here. I just pray that you bring encouragement in their life today. Again, we left before you tub as he's going to be having surgery. That things go smoothly and well, that he can have a good, quick recovery and, and a beneficial um, outcome from, from the surgery. Father, for any other needs that may be going on in our, our family's life here, we just lift each one before you. We ask your blessings on each one. And we ask for your safety throughout this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, the weather's starting to get a little bit nicer, but uh, still be careful what you do and what you do, where you go. And, and uh, you all have a blessed week, safe week, and look forward to seeing you again next week. And again next week, uh, Julie and I will be here, but we're going to have a guest speaker, uh, Quick A.